Facebook memes or things on Google. I don't know. All right. <laughs> so let's, uh, we're going to think about this question. And I'm sort of half trying to do this for fun and also half trying to make a point. So here we go. Maybe before we do that, we should just stop and ask why are people riled about this? What is it that gets people riled? Why did they want to push back on this? And I'm going to suggest there are probably three reasons. Uh, reason number one is people are not literary in character. So a rhetorical question can get taken with a little bit of extreme seriousness, right? So when Elizabeth in our te gospel text this morning said, why do I have the privilege of meeting the mother of my Lord? She wasn't expecting Mary to like give her an answer. Right? She wasn't expecting Mary to say, well, hmm, let me explain that to you. Wasn't, is that, that's not how rhetorical questions go. This is a, a statement of marvel. Ain't that something? Right? Which isn't a question, but gets at sort of the same idea. So that's one thing. That's maybe not the main thing, that people are wooden readers. The second thing, though, would be there's a Christian piety uh, and reverence for the mother of our Lord that perhaps is predisposed to be concerned if anything should be seen to somehow detract from her, if not divine character, her special human exalted status. The thought that Mary should maybe know less than we would hope or somebody might think she might know uh, arouses certain concern. So it's not a surprise that a lot of the uh, pushback, not all of it, comes from Catholic circles. And then the third thing is people don't read their Bibles carefully. They assume things rather than reading them, reading their Bibles with a certain sobriety about what it actually says and doesn't say. And so when you put, pro, uh, when you, when, when you put uh, carelessness together with piety, sometimes you'll come up with things that are not entirely necessary. So, um, what did Mary know? What could Mary know? And the answers before the birth of Christ have to come from basically two texts. They have to come, first of all, from what uh, Gabriel said to her, which is probably the most important thing. And then, secondly, what we hear Mary saying herself in what we call the Magnificat. So, when the Archangel Gabriel makes his announcement to Mary, this is what he says. Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. All right, very famous words. Um, what do they actually say? Or another way to ask the question is, how could Mary have possibly heard them? Right? Not exactly the same question, but the second question is an interesting index on the first question. What could Mary have possibly heard? Okay, the takeaways, he will be great in and of itself. Um, not a lot to say about that. Talking about a great man. Um, more than that, it does not say. But then it says he will be called son of the Most High. And of course, Most High is a circumlocution and kind of classic Jewish speech for God Almighty, for the God of Israel, right? And we all know that. So there's no difference between saying son of the Most High and son of God other than that this is a little bit more poetic. But, but what does son of the Most High mean? Or what could it mean to Mary? And I think the answer is pretty straightforward. At the time that uh, Mary could hear Gabriel saying this, Son of God is used in two ways in Jewish literature starting in the Old Testament. Number one, to refer to the people of Israel as God's special possession. Out of Egypt I have called my son, which is not an individual, but it's the corporate people of Israel. So Israel is seen as God's son corporately. God is seen as the father to Israel, his son. And then secondly, 
and probably more directly applicable here, son of God language is a way to speak of a Messiah figure, right? So you think of the, the Psalter, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, those kinds of passages, um, uh, 2 Samuel 7, where the son of God is another way of talking about God's Messiah, which is another way of talking about a descendant of David who will take up the Davidic dynasty and fulfill the promises yet unfulfilled to David and his uh, successors. He will be given the throne of his father, David, and will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Well, now that, that's about as clear as it can get. There is a, a promise to David and his progeny. The throne of David is bigger than David, a person himself, but it has to do with his lineage, and it stands for a messianic deliverer for Israel, um, a true and ultimate king that will throw off um, their oppressors and bring peace and righteousness to the nation. So a messianic reference. And then finally, of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, um, from a Christian standpoint, we think no end in terms of eternality, a, a, a timelessness that never comes to an end. But another way to think about it in terms of Old Testament language is a kingdom of which there will be no end is an ongoing lineage of prosperity, a dynasty that will never finally be overthrown. Right. So in and of itself, none of this language in itself refers to a divine figure. It just doesn't preclude, it doesn't mean that the figure herein referred to could not be divine, it just would not connote that to any reader uh, in, in the first century, or at least the first half of the first century, um, and certainly not somebody like Mary. Now, uh, you'll see there are surprises then coming. Um, one way to think about the Gospel of Luke and its first two chapters, which we call the infancy narrative, is to think of it in these terms. It, it really is, in some ways, the end of the Old Testament and not just the beginning of the New. In other words, we are still pre-Christ and we are still looking forward, which is why we spend so much time in, in Advent, to the coming of the Christ. Or if not the end of the Old Testament, the transition between the Old and the New Testament. It's fairly clear that Luke as an author, after his fancy dancy first four verses, you know, O Theophilus, inasmuch as many have undertaken to, to write an account of the things which have been fulfilled among us, I too, having followed all things closer to the top, you know, taken pen to hand and investigate everything carefully and now write to you so that you might know the truthfulness of everything that has been fulfilled among us, right? That's a paraphrase. It pretty much says that. It, this is a place where the author of Luke uses a word that we translate in English in as much, right? Epitaper in Greek. So <clears throat> real people don't talk like that. They don't talk like that now. You don't say in as much very often. I mean, if you do, probably for, it's an affect, affectation. <laughs> you probably do it for a reason. You don't say epideper all that much in Greek in the, old, in, in the ancient times either. The point is that Luke is showing an elevated diction here. He's showing I'm the kind of guy who can make good on the sort of claims that I'm making in this first very long complex Greek sentence. And then the next thing you know, you go to verse 5, and he says, and it came to pass in the days of. And it came to pass in the days of. Now, what does that sound like? Well, to us, it sounds like Charlie Brown Christmas special. But uh, to his readers, it would remind them of the diction of the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, or what we would later call the Septuagint. It, 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 it tells us the author is deliberately code switching to sound biblically narratible. That's what he's doing, and he's doing it on purpose. It would be like, or not at all unlike, 
me switching into King James English in the middle of something. You would totally know that it happened, and you'd think there must be a reason for having done that. Well, that's what Luke does beginning at chapter, verse, chapter 1, verse 5. He picks up the language and the style, the idiom of biblical narrative, and the point, I think, is I don't know if Luke thought he was writing the first chapters of the New Testament or not, but I do think he thought he was writing the last chapters of the Old Testament. And I think that's what he's actually trying to do. Okay, so that's the context in which we read these kinds of statements. It's still, we're still reading the Old Testament, if you will. So, um, this is what Mary says um, after her encounter with Elizabeth. Now, this is our third time today, or fifth, if you're a clergy. Uh, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. <clears throat> now, who is she talking about here? I think she can only be talking about God. Um, I don't think, at least yet, there is any reference to the son that's to be born. My soul magnifies the Lord, Septuagint, Greek, for the God of Israel, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Well, that's an Old Testament way to refer to God. What, who we would refer to in Christian terms, God the Father. For he, God, has regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty, again, has to be God, has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Now, right from a Christian Trinitarian perspective, um, we have no reason not to, and many reasons to, infer that what is here said of God, the, the God of Israel, whom to, we would refer to as God the Father, should also be attributed to God the Son, and not less the Holy Spirit. But there's no reason to think that that's what Mary is referring to. Right? So we're talking about levels of reading at times, in time. Then she goes on, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. And this is where, if you were in church, or paid attention in church, I say there's a transition being made where she speaks in the third person, Plural about people that God shows mercy to, singular about actions that God does. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his posterity forever. Now, uh, I want us to, again, note that there's nothing in this that we should think properly refers to the child that Mary is bearing. Not, not intrinsically. There's no uh, reasonable uh, suggestion along those lines. Again, it is still the he, the pronouns here, are the God referred to in verses 46 through 49, God, the God of Israel. Secondly, you notice that there's a, you, you may not notice, there is a big translation challenge in this whole section. And this is the challenge. The verb tense that is used here in this text is a past tense verb, or a verb that's normally translated as a past tense verb. In the Greek grammar, we call it an aorist tense. So, <clears throat> Whereas you might have expected Mary in this context to say, he will show the strength of his arm. He will scatter the proud in the imagination of the hearts. He will put down the mighty. And I'm not saying by conceptually that she's not saying that, but the verb tense itself does not connote that. Or you might expect her to say, he shows strength with his arm. He scatters the proud. But the verb tense that she uses is normally used in a way that's translated as a simple past by English speakers. It has more flexibility, however, in Greek. Um, it can refer to actions that don't so much happen in the past, like a simple past tense, but actions that are characteristic. So sometimes called the global or constitutive use of the aorist tense, things that are nomically, characteristically true. 
which is why in some English translations, this will get translated with a kind of present tense. He shows strength with his arm. That's just what he does, <laughs> right? He helps his servant Israel. It's just what he does. He fills the hungry with good things. Not so much that he is doing it now, it's just that that's what he does. That's his character. It, he's that kind of a God, okay? I think that that's what Mary is getting at here. So he's referring to the character of God who characteristically, already in the past, especially now in the conception of this child and with high expectation in the near future does this kind of thing and will do it supremely through my child. Now, what does that say about what Mary knows? Honestly, not that much. God does this kind of thing. There's something about the conception and bearing of this child that will continue in God continuing to do that kind of thing. What form and what shape it should take? How could Mary know? What could Mary know? Does this tell us that he would be a miracle worker? Not, not necessarily. Certainly not obviously. Would, would it tell us that he would die on a cross? I mean, probably especially not that. It's especially if what Gabriel said was true. Right? Of his kingdom there will be no end. I think when you get crucified, that's the end of a kingdom by normal standards, right? So what, is, what does Mary know? <laughs> the answer is she knows God is doing something like he has done before and, it, and he's renewing it now and that the child she is going to bear is somehow going to be critical to that whole enterprise. But how? And this is characteristic of the way prophecy is given in the Bible. Now just think about Advent 3. Last week, we met John the Baptist, Luke chapter 3, and he says, that axe is laid at the root of the tree. That threshing fork's already in his hand. He's going to take that chaff and burn it with unquenchable fire. Right? Well, what does John the Baptist think was going to happen? Well, there's somebody coming after me, the threshing fork. That's not a fork, by the way. In Greek, that's a shovel, for sure. Never a fork. Is not separating wheat from chaff. John's already done that. That's the purpose of his ministry, is to separate wheat from chaff. Somebody is coming immediately after me, and the grain is going to go one direction, the chaff is going to go another, the threshing floor will be clear, and the chaff will burn in unquenchable fire. Was John wrong? Kind of. <laughs> John was talking about the second advent and didn't know it. What John was not prepared for as a prophet was the way the Messiah would come in the first advent. Right? Because in the first advent, the chaff and Jesus, far from being burned in unquenchable fire, seemed to get along surprisingly well. Disturbingly well, according to John. So much so that when he's put in prison for speaking up against Herod Antipas, he sends messengers to Jesus, and what does he ask? Um, kind of important existential question here. Are you the one, or should I be, have been waiting for another? Sort of important, since I'm about to get beheaded, and you were supposed to do some things, and you're doing the opposite. Right? So was John wrong? No. Did he understand everything about Jesus? No, everything he spoke about Jesus was true, but he didn't know how it was true. Everything Mary is saying in the Magnificat is very true. How it is true still eludes as it should. Mary's grasp. Now there is one hint to the contrary, and it's when Simeon comes to Mary and says this about the child. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Okay, so what he's saying is that within Israel, this child of yours is going to be a decisive fulcrum separating one sort of Israelite from another. The fall and rising of many, and a sign that is spoken against. In other words, 
he will meet opposition. Which is why, in parentheses, we, by translation, he says to Mary, and by the way, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Now, is any of that available to Mary through Gabriel? It's not. Is it reflected in the Magnificat? Not that we can see. But here, for the first time, and this, we would call this foreshadowing in literary terms, there's a hint, a strong hint, from Simeon that this child is going to be a source of tremendous sorrow to you, Mary. And it's because he will be facing opposition that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Okay. So, what do we think? Mary, did you know? Back to the, our song. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? No. <laughs> Why would I? What, what should lead me to expect that? Now, I know that in the Old Testament, Mary could say, there is one who treads upon water. I know that. And over and over again, that one is the God of Israel. Metaphorically, treads on the waves of the sea, which are seen as the source of metaphor for extreme chaos, the most irascible part of creation. And in extolling God's power in the Old Testament, we are told in repeated terms that he can walk on that water and still it that it's not too much for him. This is a way that the Old Testament extols God's ultimate sovereignty over all creation. So I know about that kind of walking on water, but I have no reason to think that the child in my womb will do that. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Yeah. But how? What would that look like? Yeah, I, that much I get because somehow he's going to execute the fortunes of Israel as God has promised them to us. But how? I guess I would have pictured it a little differently than the way it turned out. Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? That did not occur to me. <laughs> Say more, right? I mean, what? Hello? That's not a Davidic. Davidic kings don't make individual people new. They don't, they don't make them better people, right? They rule over nations. They rule with an iron rod. They bring righteousness. They bring justice. They bring peace. But internal change in people? Well, it's like a category mistake. I don't know. What? Mary, that this child would be, would, uh, you delivered will soon deliver you? <laughs> See above. Yeah, I guess, but... Boy, not quite the way this worked out. Next verse. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? No. I had no reason to think that. Now, I am aware, Mary could say, I've read Isaiah, um, that when the Messianic era comes, it will be accompanied with changes in the natural order of things, such that the, the, the blind shall see and the lame shall walk, right, and the mute shall speak again. I have read about that, but I've had, I've had no reason, if Gabriel is right about my son, that he'll assume the Davidic throne, I have no reason for thinking that that person will do these kinds of things, because nobody else thought that either. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? No. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. Now that's a curveball. Should I have? <laughs> uh, really? Is there any indication from Jewish scriptures in what we would call like Second Temple Jewish literature that the one who assumes the throne of David is also fully divine. An exalted human being, right? God's special treasured person.
person, for sure, but divine? Does Son of the Most High mean second person of the Trinity? Now it does. <laughs> but could it to have meant that to Mary? Well, there's just no tracks to run on. There's no, there's no way to think that. That's a curveball. You Please understand, I'm not denying <laughs> this, right? I'm asking what Mary could have known. Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. And again, I've heard about this. It's very familiar. Isaiah, you know, if you do a scroll of Isaiah's greatest hits, chapter 35, chapter 61, and so on, these are the things he keeps talking about will happen in some eschatological future for Israel, right? And this will be the sign that we're in a messianic era. But is there any reason to assign those functions to the son of David? And the answer is not until Jesus, right? Not until Jesus. So this is what I mean about Bible reading. As people who have not just an Old Testament, but a New Testament, it's easy for us to read the unfolding of the New Testament as if all of its characters had a New Testament too. Or perhaps worse, it's easy to read the unfolding events of the New Testament um, as though they didn't know their Old Testaments, but in fact, they surely knew it better than we do. So another way to say it is, if you want to read the Bible well, at some historical level, it means assuming that um, assuming a maximal knowledge of the Old Testament and a zero knowledge of the New Testament. Now, that's not a final way to read the Bible, is it? Like a final way to read the Bible is we got it all. We got the whole thing. We have a canon, and so we can go back and read the Magnificat for example, with a different set of lenses and say, there are things that Mary could not know that we now do know, which doesn't make Mary wrong, but means that we have a particular privilege in salvation history to know what we can know, right? But could Mary know it? Probably not. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Again, no, see above. A special creation, <laughs> conceived in unusual terms, but Lord of it, I did not see that coming. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Well, that, I, yes, I got that, <laughs> somehow, right? The Old Testament tells me that the son of David will do that. Did you know that your baby boy was heaven's perfect lamb? Wait, what? What do you mean, lamb? What are you talking about? Well, this is a Simeon surprise, right? The sword will pierce your own heart. What do you mean, lamb? In what way is Jesus a lamb? Mary bearing a child. So tell me more about this. What's going to happen? What are you suggesting? Right? Who saw the son of David... As a Passover lamb? Or the sacrificial victim of Yom Kippur? What? No. And the sleeping child you're holding is the great, the great I am. Well, Jesus thought that about himself, judging from the Gospel of John. But Mary couldn't have seen that coming. Now, what am I trying to say here? <laughs> I'm not trying to say that these things aren't true. What I'm saying is they're almost unbelievable. They almost defy comprehension that nobody could see them coming because they could not have been conceivable until the person of Jesus Christ was both the Davidic Messiah, the son of David, who will rule in righteousness, 
and also the suffering servant. But until Jesus, nobody put those two characters together. That the one who trampled the waves and the one within two decades of walking in his sandals in Palestine would come to be understood by the very earliest Christians against all monotheistic instinct to belong to the divine identity of God already within years of his earthly life. But nobody could have seen that coming until it came, as indeed it did in Jesus Christ. What I'm suggesting here is to overestimate what Mary could have known will be to severely underestimate the paradoxical mystery and divine wisdom of God revealed through Jesus Christ. Mary, did you know? Nobody knew. Angels long to look into such things, one Peter says. Angels didn't know it. And if angels didn't know it, Mary didn't know it. We know it now. Mary knows it really well. And shed many a tear and rejoiced beyond any of our rejoicing for it all to come to pass. So we're going to cut this song a little bit of slack. (laughs) More importantly, and by far more importantly, we're going to rejoice in the paradoxical outworking of God's mysterious purposes in history. The God who does not do what we expect, but what he has planned according to his eternal purposes, to which we yield ourselves in the ongoing fulfillment in history as people who follow the way of the cross and who live the life of resurrection. All right. Any questions or comments or follow-up would be much welcome. Happy to pass the mic. I have, uh, I have a question, um, and this comes from a very imperfect knowledge of Luke's gospel, and, and, um, and also it's, an, it's always an unfair question to ask like, why things don't appear in the mm-hmm. text, but like, in terms of the, the Jesus narrative, doesn't Mary sort of drop away? Like after playing this incredibly important role in the birth of the Messiah and in these infancy narratives, like what happens to Mary? Do we basically just sort of totally lose tr- mm-hmm. track of her after that? Or, or, right. and, and if so, why? Why do you think that's the case? So I'll start with the second question, which is I don't think anybody knows why. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe, Julie, maybe Julian knows. <laughs> Uh, I don't think anybody knows why, but I think we can say this, that um, the core of the Gospel of Luke is derived from the Gospel of Mark. I think that's pretty close to beyond dispute. So um, you have the Gospel of Mark, which has no birth narrative, right? You just got John the Baptist out in the wilderness. Um, And Luke follows Mark rather closely, except largely when he thinks that Mark is being redundant, right? So, you know, Mark will tell two stories of the feeding of the 5,000 and then the 4,000, and Luke will be like, you know, you feed a few thousand people, we get the idea. We're not going to kind of keep doing that. So, so there, um, he'll follow Mark pretty closely. He leaves some things that are, he regards as redundant in Mark out, But then Luke has a whole surfeit of other material that fills out the rest of his gospel that either Mark didn't have or didn't bother to use. And included in that material are the stories that make up the first two chapters, which Mark doesn't have. So it may just be, if you'll, I think you can forgive me, but maybe others wouldn't, maybe just be a matter of sources. Like what what did Luke have access to? What, what could he have known, right? So only the Gospel of John tells us about 
Mary and, and you know, her entrusting, being entrusted to the beloved disciple. So we only have that in that gospel. But you're right, Mary's, the family, plays um, one small part, but otherwise just isn't, isn't there. It may just have finally to do with sources. And another way to say, a different way to think about this is that Luke chapters 1 and 2 give... Um, more than a prediction of what's going to happen, they function like a question, which is to say, okay, this uh, child of Mary is going to be great. It's going to be a, um, a, have a Davidic messianic stature. He is somehow going to renew God's ongoing purposes as it regards the downtrodden and the poor. Um, what will that look like? And it doesn't tell you. <laughs> It, it raises the question and asks you, well, I would keep reading. So that when Jesus shows up in the chapter 4 in the synagogue um, in Nazareth and says, takes his time finding a certain passage in Isaiah, I think probably off, le- off of the lectionary, and, and says, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, anointing me to preach the good news to the poor. Today this is fulfilled in your hearing. <clears throat> He's starting to answer that question. But there would have been other ways to answer that question. One of the other ways to answer that question would be like the Psalms of Solomon in chapter 18, where the Davidic king comes in and, and knocks some heads around in Jerusalem and, and does away with the chaff and exalts the righteous. And that's not what Jesus does. Uh, so, long answer, tough question, but I, the best I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm glad that Father Seth asked that question. I was thinking of what happened to Mary as well. We don't hear about her until the death of Jesus, and we hear about what she did. What would you imagine she knew about her son at the time he was crucified? <laughs> I think the key word in your question is imagine. <laughs> which would give me pause to answer, I think. Um, Presumably, Mary knew the passion predictions that Jesus made to his disciples. Look, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests and elders. And when he, each time he says this, he says, but I will rise again. Um... And the disciples just don't, this just like goes over their head. They just don't get it. Maybe Mary understood that. Um, It seems nonetheless that the resurrection of Jesus uh, was not only a moment of joy, but still surprise to everyone. Um, so, So I don't know. We guess. Resurrections tend to surprise people. I have a question about, um, is it possible that even Mary did not say these words, um, the Magnificat? The reason I'm saying is, at the beginning, when the angel comes and uh, tells Mary what's going to happen, and we are told that she pondered Mm -hmm. on these things, Mm -hmm. which means she did not get it exactly, and she was just thinking about it for a while. So I don't know how long it took for for her to come up with these words, or is it something that somebody added? This is a great question, which I thought about talking about and decided to avoid. (laughs) (laughs) But since somebody asked, I'll I'll not avoid it and say, you know, there's, there's kind of two possible answers, and they're not exactly mutually exclusive. One answer is, like, where did we get this Magnificat from anyway? That that's a, seems a pretty fair question. So, of course, one answer could be, we know enough to know that Mary lived on um, among apostles, um, um, among the followers of Jesus after his death and resurrection. So there's no reason to think that she didn't tell these stories, right? That, you know, and then Gabriel... I guess it was Gabriel. I think it's Gabriel. <laughs> Came to me and said this, and, and then I met Elizabeth, and my heart welled up, and I said something like this, right? 
without denying that possibility, the other thing is you just have to think about the art of biblical narrative, period. And the art of biblical narrative has Jonah writing a poem in the belly of a whale. Now, I'm not saying he didn't. <laughs> I'm just saying it's part of the genre to stylize that sort of thing, right? And even the, you know, the, the, the Roman historian Herodotus said, when it comes to speeches, if you know what they said, you gotta say what they said. And if you're not sure what they said, you should say what they sh would have said or possibly ought to have said, right? And so both, you know, sort of Greco-Roman historical method and even more so biblical narrative method is to say, this is an incredible, surprising birth. And then I would say, not unlike Samuel to Hannah, which becomes the prototype for her song, with differences, of course. Um, and that's part of the narrative biblical art. Now, it could be that the church already knew this hymn and possibly even prayed it together. We don't, you know, there's no way to know that. But it, it, it may be something, it may be something like that. Mary's heart rejoiced. Uh, she was a pious Jewish girl. It reminded her of the scriptures. She said, I felt like Hannah. I mean, maybe something like that, right? I sound like Anna. And somebody's like, yeah. See, you would have said, and then the next thing you know, it, it's a part of a narrative. It's not so much made up as it's, it's a conceit of the genre, part of the biblical art of, of narrative. Probably something like that. For the people at home. I love the opening hymn about Gabriel. Mm -hmm. And... I was wondering, how did Gabriel know these things, and who told him to go to Mary? I mean, Gabriel has some built-in advantages, right? With angels, angels who don't know everything still have a, 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 an unmediated access to God. So the whole point, an angel, another word for angel, angelos in Greek is messenger. So this first and foremost thing in a position description of an angel is to send, convey messages. And if they're conveying messages, the messages are those given to them by God. Can you refresh us on um, the, like Mary's age, her like socioeconomic context, like, uh, uh, like what we know and what we guess at? Right, well, I think it's more of a matter of guessing than knowing because it, the Proto-Evangelion of James is our source. So a, a post-New Testament extra-biblical text is where we know most of, no, most of what we think about Mary in the tradition. And we, we have reason to think she's a teenage girl. Um, newly, you know, probably recently pubescent. A, a young, younger teenager um, raised by pious parents, um, and beyond that, um, pious, but as best we know, pious and poor are veritable synonyms in first century Judaism, right? So blessed are the poor, it's, um, not too far away from saying blessed are the righteous, blessed are the, the, those who are so devoted to God that they suffer socioeconomically. Right, so probably not of, um, not of high estate. So when she says that God cast down the mighty from their thrones and feeds the poor and um, judges the rich, she's speaking out of an experience that you know, is existential for her and not abstract. from the Magnificat that she was an educated uh, young woman to, to look into history and say what was happening with God is, was that, isn't that astonishing for a young Jewish woman? Yeah, probably the safer thing to say is that there were no educated young Jewish women of her social stripe. So the most you could say for her is that she knew God's story mediated to her, in, you know, through, through her parents and temple worship. Sure, yes. And then, uh, 
uh, she said to the people there, do what he tells you to do. So right. she knew something then. Yes. And I would say that the wedding at Cana is the place where Mary transfers from mom to disciple. And Jesus makes sure that that happens. Because she brings a complaint to him. And do you remember what he says? Woman. Why should I care? Who are you to tell me what to do? Now you're, you're going to say, ooh, he didn't, say, he didn't talk like that. That's the way he talked. He says, woman. Not mom. Woman. It's a dis distanciation. I'm not saying Jesus didn't have affection for his mom, but he was her Lord. Woman. And then the next thing he says, what between you and me is a literal translation. What between you and me? Which is, <clears throat> which is what Jesus said to the demons that he cast out of legion. Right? So it's not gentle. It's like, what are you getting up in my business for? Who are you to tell me what to do? Okay. Uh, now, I, I put that sharply, right? Because I think people soften it. The point of it is that when Jesus speaks that way, what does Mary do? Got it. <laughs> do whatever he says. And if you'll permit me, and from this point forward, I plan on doing the same. <laughs> right? My, my son is is the Lord. So it's a transition, or it's, it's access to a transition that we have in the narrative that where Mary ch changes, I mean, she'll always be his mom, but from mom now plus disciple. At we're at time, so that's a great place to end. Um, thank you so much for giving us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's always fun to be here. Thanks for inviting. All right. Take care, all.